And then there was a global financial crisis. And I just remember hearing on the news, economist after economist saying, oh, well, it's, it's time to rewrite economics so that it reflects financial realities. I thought, I'll be darned it if we're only going to re rewrite economics for that. It has to reflect ecological realities. It has to reflect social realities. And it was only at that moment that I, I thought, I want to be part of the team who walk back towards economics and flip it on its head. And instead of starting with supply and demand of the market, as almost every lecture does, let's start with the fundamental values that make life work. Okay. No Leila, Velina Mike, Aloha Ika Aina, Aloha Mike Ko. Welcome to the Hawaii Book and Music Festival online festival and to this conversation produced for the festival by UH Better Tomorrow Speaker Series. Uh, I'm Kamana Maikalani Beamer. Um, really happy to share this space uh, with each of you. And uh, we're going to have a great conversation today. Uh, I'm the Dana None Hall Chair in Hawaiian Studies, Literature and the Environment at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. I'm also a co-founder of the Aina Aloha Economic Futures effort. And uh, we'll be discussing that. Um, you know, we all understand we're in a time of unprecedented change uh, that collectively we must navigate together. This requires vision, courage, hope, and community. And uh, I'd just like you to please allow me to open with a, with a song and a story. Um, and this was a chant put to music by my grandmother, uh, Winona Kapua Ilohia Manono Kalani de Shea Beamer. She was a courageous woman and a truth speaker. And, uh, you know, this song speaks, many of you might have learned it in schools as kids. It speaks of an endemic Hawaiian tree snail, the kahuli. And the kahuli establishes this relationship with a migratory bird, the kolea, the plover. And uh, kolea flies in from Siberia every year. She's actually here now. You can go out, look out on the aina. And this was a time of tremendous change. You know, the forests were being overrun with the introduction of ungulates and cattle were destroying the forests and crushing up the snails. And in this period of rapid decline, uh, because of the experience of colonization, the Kahuli strikes up a relationship with the Kolea to fetch water and it develops reciprocal relationship together. At least that's a story my grandmother would tell. So please allow me real fast. So today we're going to be talking about one of the most critical issues of our time. How can we create an economic system that is just to communities and regenerative to our earth and ecosystems? Is it possible to transition from an economy based on extraction and exploitation and endless growth to an economy that better meets a greater variety of needs for all of humanity, not just the 1%, and an economy that won't fundamentally wreck and degrade our planet? Contemporary economic models, what our guest today calls 20th century economics, devised amazing technologies, produce stunning but concentrating wealth, <laughs> and built modern civilization as we know it. But it also benefited from colonialism and slavery. It's implicated in widespread misery, global environmental degradation, and it's pushed our Earth's eco and climate systems to the brink. To survive, and certainly to thrive in greater numbers, we need to do better, much better. 
Among the world's most respected thinkers in making this economic transition is our guest today, Kate Rayworth. She's worked for the United Nations Development Program, Oxfam International. She currently serves on the World Health Organization's Council on the Economics of Health for All. She's a senior associate at Oxford's Environmental Climate Change Institute. She is the founder of the Donut Economics Action Lab, which has already pioneered adaptations of donut economics in a growing number of cities, Amsterdam, Copenhagen, Portland, Melbourne, and more. And she's even cited by Pope Francis. She's the author of the best-selling book, Donut Economics, Seven Ways to Think Like a 21st Century Economist. And it's a great pleasure and honor to introduce and give a fan aloha to our guest, Kate Rayworth. Aloha, Kate. Aloha, thank you so much. It's a real pleasure to be with you. I'm sitting in Oxford in the UK on a very dark October night, and it's just beautiful to see that sunrise out of your window <laughs> and to be here with you. Uh, mahalo. Um, so before we start, let me just say a word about the format. Uh, we're going to be harvesting questions on social media and upon registration, uh, but we want to hear from you, you know, as well, everyone that's on this call, this conversation. So if you're joining us on Zoom, you can submit questions and comments in the Q&A module. And um, one of our amazing Hawaii PhD students, Kamena Elkington, will be fielding your questions um, there, and she'll be relaying them to us. Um, so we, you can get your questions to Kate. And we're going to do our best to get to as many of them as we can. But um, let's open up this, this conversation. And um, Kate, maybe you can kind of talk us through, you know, before we turn to solutions, um, talk a little bit more about the problem. You know, in the, in the dismissal of science of economics, how did growth become the end? You know, the be all and do all. <laughs> Uh, how did it develop, you know, certain ways of counting kinds of labor um, and, and determining what's more important than others? Yeah, how did growth become the end that never ends? <laughs> <laughs> That's the conundrum. So in Western economic thinking, growth became the end that never ends. Not very long ago, we have to, we have to take hope from the fact that this is actually a relatively new concept this shape of progress that has been put at the heart of Western economics is only really since the 1930s and 40s. So it's not even 100 years old. It's quite young. And it began uh, post-crash, 1929 crash in the US. A brilliant scientist, a brilliant economist called um, Simon Kuznets was asked by US Congress to come up with one number to measure the output of the American economy. Uh, because until then, it had all been measured in tons of steel and tons of grain. And he did. He came up with this one number. He figured out a way to add it all together. And it became what we call national income or, or, or GDP, gross domestic product. And he gave a warning, too, though, that this, this was scarcely a measure of a nation's welfare. But the warning was pushed aside because the number, the power of the one number is so great. And once policymakers had this one number of the output of the economy and then it was started to be measured across countries, the obvious next question they began to ask is, and how much bigger does it get each year? Because the idea that an economy growing became synonymous with success. And when you have a labor intensive economy where the growth of the economy means more workers are employed in the factories, means more people are going home with a big pay packet in their pocket, means more families can provide for their essential wants and needs. Things go well. It seems to work. And so from the 1940s to the 50s to the 1960s, growth became seen as the panacea for any country's problems, whether it's unemployment or inflation or a balanced trade deficit or inequality, growth would apparently be the main solution to this. And I love to symbolize and represent it. I, I always never, never leave my desk or home without a piece of hose pipe because it, it's really important to, to make visible the, the concepts and the visual shapes that sit in the back of our minds. And this is the shape of progress that 20th century Western economics tells us is, is the way to success. You want your nation's economy, its national income to grow. Three and a half percent per year was seen as the healthy, sustainable rate. You want it to grow 
endlessly to the end that never ends. It would just keep going up through the ceiling. And what's extraordinary to me is that even in today's richest countries, and I'm sitting in one of them in the UK, across Europe, across the United States, Canada, Australia, Japan, these are countries that are richer than any nation has ever been before. And yet, listen to the economists, listen to the politicians, and they will tell you that the success of these nations, even these nations, lies in yet more growth without end. And there's something profoundly absurd about that. But also, when we just look around, we see that the growth that we've been getting has not gone to the workers into their pay packets because actually we've seen national incomes grow rapidly and the money, a lot of that in, from, in the US particularly, the vast majority of that growth is going into the hands and the pockets of the 1%. And the average worker is seeing no increase in their wages. So growth is not delivering well-being for all. It's also delivering extraordinary ecological footprints on the planet through climate em carbon emissions, through our material footprints. And so it's jeopardizing the health of the planet. And to me, this is a very serious reason why we need to rethink what's measured there. Mm. Thank you, Kate. Thank you for that incredible insight. And I think we can see the impacts of some of that, you know, here in our islands. Um, and, and we're struggling with many of those issues uh, where, you know, we we went from about 200 years ago, a fairly self-reliant community, um, you know, with indigenous knowledge and systems and these long-standing familial kin-like relationships with the natural world and the environment in many ways. Um, and this, you know, steady transition towards uh, this more extractive <laughs> economy, you know, from sandalwood to uh, large-scale sugar plantations uh, to where we're at now in, in battling tourism. Um, and, and although the numbers keep going up, uh, at least prior to COVID, you know, it was 6 million tourists, 8 million tourists. And just like you're saying, that growth, uh, being on islands, we can see there are a finite amount of resources around us. And, you know, the, the larger the numbers got didn't necessarily meant more, <laughs> better well-being for the people here in the islands. So I, I think a lot of these stories resonate. You, you also, in your book, you talk about this. Uh, I found this one segment on Adam Smith, really fantastic, where, you know, he, he devises this, you know, free market economy and hands off and, <laughs> but um, fails to account for, you know, his, his mother's <laughs> feeding him and, <laughs> and that doesn't account into his economy. So can you talk a little bit about that, what it is we count and what matters? <laughs> yes. So Adam Smith was a brilliant thinker, as in many of these thinkers. And it's, it, they, they came up with amazing ideas of their time, which are often plucked out of context. And we ignore everything else that they wrote. But Adam Smith is, is often quoted to justify free markets, not that they really exist, but the idea of the power of the market, that the market will solve everything, or at least is the first best solution. So when Adam was writing his most famous book, um, The Wealth of Nations, he wrote this line in it. He said, it is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer and the baker that we should expect our dinner. It is from their own regard to their own interest. And so what he was saying was, look, they're not making your bread and your beer and your your bacon because they're being kind to you. They're making it because you're paying them and it's their self-interest to supply it and you're the customer and you demand it. And this line is quoted again and again to show that markets mean people serve each other's wants and needs. And it's true, markets are a very powerful mechanism for coordinating the wants and needs of millions or billions of people who may never even speak online to provide and demand Two caveats with markets I'll start with. One, they only serve those who can pay. The rest they ignore. And they only value what's priced. The rest they exploit. But there's another caveat to Adam's story, which is that when he was writing this book, he was 43 years old. He had never married. He didn't have a wife. He didn't have children tugging on his coat. He was living at home with his mum. And you can bet that she made his dinner every day. And so as Adam was writing, I just wish, I, and I, I imagine the moment when he was with his quill writing, it is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, the butcher, that his mum, if she had only said, Adam, dinner's on the table. And he would have thought, oh my goodness, but my dinner also comes from the benevolence of my mother. And he would have perhaps right there on the spot invented what was 
what is now known as feminist economics, recognition of the unpaid caring work of the household, which only came 250 years later. He missed it. He, his mom didn't call him for tea. And so he didn't include it in his monumental work. And so for the next 250 years, economics proceeded as if what's valuable is going to be showing up under prices. And so we have the market and then we have state provision, but it missed the household. And that's where we begin every day in the unpaid caring work of being parents and children and partners and neighbors and carers and relatives. And that's often what makes life worth living and makes life work. But he also missed the commons, which I, I'll tell you, so many economists, if you mention the economists, uh, the commons, so many Western trained economists say, well, oh, what's the commons? They haven't actually heard of it. It's not even taught. So the commons are a place where people come together not through price exchange with the market, not through public goods provided by the state, but as a community. And that community co-produces goods or services that they collectively value. It could be culture. It could be a festival. It could be a, a, a neighborhood garden on the corner of your block. It could be Wikipedia on the World Wide Web. And these are all commons that we co-create. There may be no money changing hands, but the What's created there is of high value to people. Now, when we have economies that only measure market output and public sector output, we are missing the care of the household. We are missing the creativity of the commons. We're also missing the generosity of the living world. And to proceed in the 21st century with metrics that miss those would be to miss almost the heart of what makes life work. And that's why we need to start our, our economics, recognizing all forms of value creation, all things that we value. The market is just a part of it. You know what, if Adam were alive today, I actually think if, if, if someone put his tea on the table in front of him, he'd, he'd get that. And he would be the first because he also talked about empathy. He wrote another book called The Theory of Moral Sentiments, and he cared about empathic connection between people. He cared about community. His ideas, like so many, have been plucked and used for one purpose that I think would have him turn in his grave. I see. Yeah, well, thank you for sharing that, Kate. I think it really speaks to how important it is to consider the things that we do count, right? And and what we consider valuable because, you know, intuitively, yeah, our, our ohana, our families, our households, the things we share together as a community are the things that make us resilient, you know, that make us yes. strong. <laughs> and, um, and I found that just really insightful um, the way you told that story in your book. And thank you for sharing, you know, the, the commons is an important um, consideration here in Hawaii. There's a lot of efforts towards community stewardship of marine resources, for instance. And, you know, we, we're trying to re-achieve balance, uh, a little too much top-down and not enough bottom-up empowerment of community when it comes to managing, you know, diverse fish species that spawn at different times during the year, depending on where you're at. Community input and, and insight and ancest ancestral knowledge is, is really critical, you know, for better managing our, our near shore resources. And this is something we did very well, um, you know, just a few uh, generations before that now has, has sort of rapidly changed. So and can I you. ask you about that? Yes. Can I ask you about that? Because the skills we need to interact in markets, for example, are very different from the skills that we need to be effective commoners, mm. to steward a common resource, uh, to collaborate, to co-create, to guard an, uh, something and protect it, and to ensure that all of the members of that commons protect it. And I would love to hear if you feel that those skills were lost and need to be relearned, or whether they mm -hmm. feel nascent, or and, and there's still an echo of them in the culture that can bring them back. Because I, I think one of the crucial things for the success of the commons is going to be able to point to places where it is returning or thriving. And, and as you said, you know, the sense of community stewardship, that's it, that's mm -hmm. it. And, and do you feel that that is, has been saved and is being re-amplified or is it having to be relearned? Um, no, I think it's definitely been preserved in our, in our communities, um, you know, and, and depending on where you go throughout our islands, we have incredible community champions of, of Aloha Aina. Um, you know, on, on Molokai, uh, there's 
large initiatives working to restore fish ponds. And these were ancestrally created, essentially aquacultural systems that were used to farm algae and, and to grow herbivorous fish. And, and they were connected to these malka or terrestrial areas of uh, wetland taro cultivation, where you try to create nutrient rich water, you grow your taro and, and then it feeds into these fish ponds. Um, many of them were filled in, you know, in, in the period of uh, the change in our economy, the occupation of Hawaii. And um, we've lost a number of these fish ponds. I think there were over 400 at one point. Um, and now I believe we have close to 88 or somewhere in there. Um, but nevertheless, incredible community resilience and collaboration around these sites here today. And I can mention all across our islands, Paipai Ohe'ia on Oahu. Um, we have these great, you know, amazing leaders, Waipa Foundation on, on Kauai. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it, it stems from, in some ways, uh, a realization. And, and you talk about this in your book that, you know, uh, humans aren't, you know, above or disconnected from nature and our, and our biosphere and our planet. We're a part of it. And, you know, our ancestral traditions really tie us to this place in our aina. And, um, and like my great friend Malia Akuragawa says, you know, we, we have fierce aloha <laughs> for our islands and our resources. And, you know, we, these are the things that have fed us for generations and will continue. Um, so I think, you know, the, the management of the, of the commons, if you will, um, what we found is, is when you lose that community input and, on the ground place-based knowledge, it becomes harder to manage a very complex ecosystem, right? If, if it's just happening in a boardroom once a month, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's just not as adaptive. And, and that's where I think Hawaii in the conservation areas and these restoration efforts, uh, we're doing a lot of really cool work because of the resilience of our community and community leaders. So mahalo for that, Kate. Fascinating. <laughs> um, <laughs> maybe another another question um you know you you in your book you kind of call yourself and you make this cry out to be become a renegade economic uh, economist <laughs> and maybe can you talk more about that i mean you know the field of economics really drives as you're saying you know our perception of of what's possible of what's achievable of of our goals um so when did you start to take a di different direction from currents in the main field and you know, what, what made you observe and, and kind of question growth and, and where things were going? Well, I studied economics at university in the early 1990s, so I'm, I'm 50 years old. Um, so after university, I thought I would be learning the mother tongue of public policy that would really help me address issues I'd seen as a teenager arising in the world, like the hole in the ozone layer, like the famine in Ethiopia. I was fascinated by these social, ecological challenges and I thought economics would give me the skills to help address that, but the the theories I was taught, I had great teachers, but the theories I was taught just brushed these issues to the margins. They were voluntary to study if you want to. You can study environmental economics if you want to. It's not part of the essence of what we're doing here. Uh, often taking income distribution is given, so we weren't talking about deep inequalities and, and people's total exclusion from economic activity and, and, and entrenched poverty. And so at the end of four years of study economics, I just found, I, I, I never wanted to say, hello, I'm an economist. I, I, I was embarrassed. And, and you would generally find, and it's a bit of a joke, right? If you say, hello, I'm an economist, people say, uh, I, I, I'm just off to get a drink or I'll, I'll see you later, you know, backing off. All people that are intimidated when I was writing my book, I would say to people, I'm I'm writing a book about rethinking economics. And, and the first thing they say is, I was never very good at maths at school. And people are intimidated. It seems remote, expert, uh, technical, dry. I, so I never wanted to be an economist. And so I walked away from that academic discipline. I didn't stay on and do a PhD because I, I was lost for a sense of connection with it. I went and worked for three years in Zanzibar. Um, and, and the story you were just telling of tourism was very real there as well. In the early 1990s, tourism had just been opened up and I was seeing tourists flocking to these islands, not realizing that this was a Muslim culture, not realizing that the advertising that told them to eat crab and lobster and fish every day 
was the, the, the abundance of this was a falsity and they were draining the seas dry and that the price of coastal land was going through the roof. Even the price of coconut palming, what they say in Swahili, makuti, was going through the roof. People couldn't afford fish or land or to build their houses. And I, I was so struck by the, the downside of tourism, um, the devastating impact of this huge money coming into a place that had a much more fragile and, and delicately balanced local economy. So I know I have relearned a lot of my economic thinking. They're working with barefoot entrepreneurs who were raising children and surviving in villages where they had barely, they had no running water, they didn't have a school, they were depending upon their community, their wits and their forest. I definitely relearned a lot there. I then went and worked the United Nations, uh, working on thinking about human development rather than economic development. And that really reoriented my thinking towards mm. a far more social and humanistic thought. And then I was working at Oxfam, I came back to the UK and that's why I now live in Oxford. It was then in the financial crisis and I was a mother. I just had twins. So I was now, unlike Adam Smith, I was immersed in the household economy. I was fully aware of the, the challenge of balancing work and family. And then there was a global financial crisis. And I just remember hearing on the news, economist after economist saying, oh, well, it's, it's time to rewrite economics so that it reflects financial realities. I thought I'll be darned it if we're only going to re rewrite economics for that. It has to reflect ecological realities. It has to reflect social realities. And it was only at that moment that I, I thought, I want to be part of the team who walk back towards economics and flip it on its head. And instead of starting with supply and demand of the market, as almost every lecture does, let's start with the fundamental values that make life work. And from there, work out what kind of economy would be in service to life. And it was, somebody said to me, oh, you're a renegade. And it was when I thought, renegade economists, okay, I can actually do that. I can be that, I can handle that. Because if you say, hi, I'm a renegade economist, immediately people know that you're being playful. It opens up a conversation and no one thinks that you're going to bore them with a spreadsheet. So that's where my return towards economics came from. Very much from outside of academia, very much from a, a journey through life, becoming a mother, living with people in Zanzibar, really immersing myself in other worlds. And so I come back at economics from a deep world experience that uh, has taught me to have the confidence to question the very flimsy fundamental assumptions at the heart of it. Oh, that's amazing. Well, mahalo for sharing that, that story and, you know, walking us through that process, Kate. It's, it's so illuminating. Um, to, to think about that, that transition. And, you know, I think this is a great time to introduce really your visual, you know, the donut. And, and you mentioned being playful as a renegade economist. Uh, econom, econonomist. <laughs> I can't even say the word because I'm having so much fun. But, um, <laughs> you mentioned the donut, you know, and I think many people, uh, even when we were doing visuals for this talk, we thought, oh, should we have a real donut and how do we do it? But um, that, that sweet spot between the planetary boundaries and, and meeting the needs of, of humanity is is so important and such a, a better visualization than you know this sort of GDP endless growth model. So maybe can you walk us through that? Sure. So this was in 2011 when I'd come back to Oxfam after maternity leave, and I was immersed in in what are the new ideas. And somebody showed me this diagram about planetary boundaries, and I had this visceral reaction, this adrenaline rush in my body. I'd seen this picture. I think this is the beginning of new economics and I, I added to it. So let me show you. Here's the donut. It's the only one that turns out to be good for us. You don't need to eat donuts. The best <laughs> ones are conceptual. So the idea here is that it's a compass for human prosperity in the 21st century. It's just one way we can imagine it. There are many ways. But if you imagine humanity's use of Earth's resources radiating out from the middle of this picture, then the hole in the middle here is a place where people are left falling short on the essentials of life. It's a shortfall for people's ability to have decent food, healthcare, education, housing, political voice, income, community, shelter. These, I, I crowdsource these 12 social dimensions from the Sustainable Development Goals. And the reason I did that was because it, it, it just affirms that all the governments in the world have already agreed that every person in the world has a claim not to live in the hole in this donut. Whether or not they have income or not, whether or not the market serves their needs, let's start not with the market, but their needs. 
Everyone must get out of this hole across this social foundation. So we want to get leave no one in the hole, get everyone into a level of resource use where they're leading a life of dignity, opportunity, and community. Mm-hmm. But, and this is a big 21st century but, but as we collectively use Earth's resources to meet these essential needs, we, we may use them carelessly or in ways where we put so much pressure on the life-supporting systems of our planetary home that we begin to kick up against this ecological ceiling. This is the point beyond which we actually risk tipping our planetary home out of balance, where we risk causing climate breakdown and acidifying the oceans. We risk creating a hole in the ozone layer and breaking down the fabric of life through biodiversity loss. We risk withdrawing so much water, converting so much land, applying so much fertilizer, chemical and air pollution, that we actually break down the fabric of what makes life work. And these are known as the nine planetary boundaries. First drawn up by a group of around 30 scientists in 2009, they said, we believe these are the nine life supporting systems that together interdependently make life work and hold earth in this incredible stable and benevolent phase of life she's been in for the last 11,000 years, which could roll and roll for another 30 or 50,000 unless we so carelessly kick ourselves out of it. So putting those together, the goal of the donor is to meet the needs of all people within the means of the living planet. And you can immediately see, and to me visuals are very, very important, you can immediately see that the shape of progress has fundamentally changed. There's no infinite growth here. This is about thriving, in balance. And if I do it with my hands, it's like staying within the donut. And and that already just feels like a heartbeat, which is a a, a sense we have deep within our own bodies. And if what we know already about balance in our bodies, if we can take that knowledge of health lies in balance from the human body to the planetary body, we give ourselves a profound metaphor for understanding the shape of progress and health. It's balance, dynamic balance. Mm. Absolutely. Thank you, Kate. I there's one of these key insights, you know, um, in, in your work and thinking about the boundaries of the planet and, and meeting the needs of, of humanity and people. And as you discuss, you know, in your book, you know, it's really that the progress of the linear economy and, and growth, you know, that, that sort of bring us to this point where where we do have to recognize, right, that there are these limits and and we have to find ways to redistribute. Um, wealth and, and resources, and, and you discuss that, you know, throughout your book um, with these stunning examples. Um, Before we go there, can I ask you a question? Yes. Because when I first drew this diagram, and I became really interested in the power of visuals, and, and it was because when I showed this to people, people immediately responded. They immediately started using it and talking with more confidence about a new kind of economy. And I was fascinated because none of the words here were new. It's not the words that they were responding to, it was the shape. And then I began researching about the power visualizations and I discovered that over half of the nerve fibers in our brain are linked to our eyesight. So we are born pattern spotters, it's why we see creatures in the clouds and and ghosts in the shadows, and and we're looking to make pattern all the time. And so it made me ask myself, well, what are the shapes that other cultures have used to represent well-being? I come from a profoundly Western inheritance of culture, and my culture had told me that the shape of progress was this. And yet when I drew this donut, it connected us to a, a circular dynamic thriving balance. And then I started looking at the symbols from many indigenous cultures. And of course, there were these thriving shapes. Think of the Taoist yin yang. Think Mm -hmm. of the Buddhist endless knot or the Celtic double spiral or the Maori takarangi or the koru. It was just so clear that so many of them had this implicit, dynamic, self-sustaining balance. And it was the Western culture that was the utter outlier. Mm -hmm. And so I would just love to understand and hear from you where um, traditions from Hawaiian uh, ancestral cultures and images, how do they connect with these kinds of uh, shapes that I'm talking about? 
Sure. Yes. Mahalo, Kate. And I, I appreciated that from your book um, also. And, you know, your recognition of the power of visuals is so important. You know, here in, here in Hawaii, um, I think we do have, we have the pico um, symbol and a pico is something that we actually have three pico that connect you to your ancestors. One is, is to gods and, and the other pico connects you to the future, you know, and, and the symbol for a pico is, is usually, it's like a, a belly button <laughs> connects us to our umbilical cord, you know, and, and that's what connects us through life. Um, so I think it, it's definitely thought of in, in, in terms of relationships between the past and, and the future. And um, we also, the word for wealth in Hawaiian, um, in, in some of our work, um, you know, we recognize is, is why, why is, is water, water. So the word for water is why, <laughs> and the word for wealth is why, why water, water. And, and really what that is suggesting from our, our kupuna, our ancestors is that wealth is, should be like, you know, the water cycle. And, and, you know, it should come in patterns, you know, it, it should repeat itself. And, and a person uh, that was wealthy is someone that could distribute water, could feed people um, and, and provide for their community. And um, so I, your insights around the donut and, you know, circular economies has really taken hold in many ways uh, in Hawaii because we recognize our, our ancestral traditions. Uh, uh, in, in some ways, we're calling our older economy an ancestral circular economy. Um, you know, it, it wasn't a subsistence economy. <laughs> we did more than subsist. Um, we had these circular relationships that we want to build off of. So um, mahalo for that, that question and that insight. And, I, you know, there isn't this linear progress line <laughs> that's, that's about achievement and, and betterment. It is about our relationships with each other, the past and the future. And can I just say that what you just t shared about um, why, why, that, that water cycle being a beautiful metaphor for having wealth that you can, I mean, to me, what I'm hearing is you have the capacity to regenerate and change form and change form and, and um, reinvest and it comes back again. And that's what, and of course, water is life. And that's what comes back. That's the most beautiful conception of wealth I have ever heard of. In fact, recently I was speaking to somebody who's older and has been very, very successful in their life in Western culture. And he was talking about what it means to be old. And he said from a, a, a very wise view, he said, I realize over life I've been accumulating things. I've accumulated knowledge and opportunities and contacts and possibilities. And at my age, in my 70s, it's now time to compost those and to give back. And that's what I heard from somebody I mean, if he knew, I'm, I'm going to tell him about why, why this idea that it's, it's the giving back because life is regenerative and that's what wealth is. So thank you for the most incredible um, idea. And I'm definitely going to look up the Pico, the belly button. <laughs> mahalo, mahalo, Kate. Mahalo for being open. And, um, you know, it's it's been a great, fantastic collaboration to just learn more about circular economies in your work, because I think there is so much insight. The fact that we were on finite islands and, you know, we lived in, we don't think of the ocean as boundaries necessarily, but, um, you know, many people do. And in that instance, Hawaii is the most isolated place really on the planet. Um, and so what we've kind of found and understood is, you know, the more that we learn about our ancestral traditions and practices and, and worldview, um, there are these fundamental insights about living on our planet because, uh, you know, our canoe people tell us, hey, wa ahimoku, you know, our, our island is like a canoe and what we contribute and what we bring on it is, is, is what we survive with. Um, so I, I can't say how excited we are about, you know, your work and, and this collaboration, Kate. Mahalo. <laughs> and can I say this? So we're talking about the concept of circular economy. Um, but I think it's really important to acknowledge, as you just did, that actually that's, a, that's again, a, a modern label, name given to something that has been practiced by peoples worldwide. Otherwise, they would not have thrived and survived on whether on islands or on lands where the resources are what you're working with. And it's a regenerative economy by design. And I think circular economy is drawing on and learning from and probably not yet learning enough from 
many, many indigenous cultures, island cultures, where that was a necessity of a way of living and that, and that regenerative practice. So it's fascinating to me if, if there are people now in Hawaii thinking about a circular economy and that wonderful interplay you must be experiencing of ideas that are coming in, new technologies, new possibilities, but how they connect with ideas that have always been here and ideas that are ours and may come from different labels and different names that our grandmothers and great grandparents talked about and how you look at the intersection of both of those. Mm -hmm. how, how is that? How is that playing out? Yeah. Well, with people like you, it's incredibly regenerative and, and positive. Um, and, and I think there's so much growth and seeding that's happening. Um, and, and yet, um, you know, there is the, the power of, of the old existing system, um, you know, that, that does generate wealth for <laughs> certain sets of our population, but not everyone. And, and that's where, you know, I think change is, is hard. Um, and, and I think we're sort of in the middle of negotiating that here in Hawaii, thinking about what is the direction, you know, are we going to continue on this path or do we have the courage and leadership, you know, to change? Um, and, and I think that that's again, where we can draw upon your, your insights and your expertise, Kate. So, you know, like we are doing here where we're engaging the power systems and structures, we're recognizing, look, there's, there's limits, <laughs> um, you know, growth that doesn't produce value. Um, as you talk about, isn't, isn't the direction we want to go in. We, we want value um, for our community and, and we want economic justice, social justice. Um, so how, how is that being achieved? You know, your, your efforts in through your circular economy lab and other places in the world, what are some of the insights and innovations? Um, you know, is there a benefit for Hawaii to, to try to become a circular economy you Can reflect on some of these? Great. Well, so first of all, let me say that, um, for me, it's very important that the concept of the donut economics is something that we've never once, um, asked anyone to talk about or use or adopt or recommend it's because what's the point of doing that it's everywhere where it's happening and being taken up is because change makers in a place have seen the ideas and said and those are useful as part of our own journey that looks like a useful set of tools concepts images that we can use in our own context and when people contact us and say we would like to work with it then we say, let's get in touch and we want to connect you with other change makers like yourselves who you can learn with. Because, for example, Barbados is engaging with the concept. Curaçao in the, in the Caribbean also is, is engaging. In, and I, I can see plenty of learning, of islands learning together. But let me just say that, well, if I come back to the donut briefly, here's the donut. Here's where we want to be. But that's not where we are, right? This is where we are. All of the red in this image shows us on the global scale, this is all the billions of people worldwide who are fully short on their essential needs. We want to eliminate all of that red human shortfall. But at the same time, we need to come back within these planetary boundaries on climate breakdown, on excessive fertilizer use, excessive land conversion, biodiversity loss, and locally, of course, many places have real pressure on these. So we need to eliminate human deprivation and ecological degradation at the same time. And this hasn't been done before. This has barely, on a global scale, been tried before. The 20th century was all about eliminating human deprivations. And, and it's turned out that the way a lot of that was done has leaked out into this ecological overshoot. And it's only now that we can start measuring this impact at the global scale that becomes absolutely visible. So we can't use old economic theories or old government policies, or old business models, we need new ones of our own times. And that's either an overwhelming challenge for some or an incredible opportunity to remember and return and restore and repair and reinvent. So for me, if we're going to turn this story around, there are two dynamics that we need to profoundly change. And the first one, hosepipe again, the first one is that we've inherited a linear degenerative economy. I call it the hosepipe economy. Stick the earth's materials in the pipe of production, make them into something we want, use it for a while and throw it away. And that's the linear take, make, use, lose. That is pushing us over planetary boundaries. And that is what we've got to change. We've got to turn that linear economy 
into what we're talking about, that circular or cyclical one. So the resources aren't used up, they're used again and again and again, far more carefully, collectively, creatively, and slowly. And some people call that a circular economy. I think the bigger name for it is a regenerative economy. That's the, 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 the why, why, that's the cycle going around, the water cycle, the nutrient cycle, but also the, the, the food cycle and the material cycle of things that we make, we must repair and restore and refurbish and reuse and share. So that's the first dynamic. But there's another one equally important, another toy that I much love. We have inherited economies that are tending to drive opportunity and value into the hands of a few. I mentioned before that, for example, in the US after the financial crash, around over 90% of the increase in GDP was going into the hands of the 1%. Globally, over the last decade, the number of billionaires has doubled from 1,000 billionaires to 2,000 billionaires. And so we see the rise of a 1% holding all opportunity value concentrated in their hands. And this utterly undermines the ability that regenerative flow between people, it creates a really deeply unequal economy. We need to open that up and create a distributive economy where resources, <laughs> resources are shared far more equitably with all who co-create that opportunity and value. And that turns out to be the whole of society. So those two dynamics from degenerative to regenerative and from divisive to distributive. Now, what that looks like in a particular place is going to vary from place to place and sector to sector and economy to economy. Uh, I'm going to give you one example of each, and I would love to hear if you have examples to share of what you see happening in these directions in Hawaii. So in the city of Amsterdam, in the Netherlands, the government has uh, decided to create a circular economy of policy where they say, we want to be 100% circular by 2050. Now, no one quite knows what that means yet, but that's like Kennedy saying, we want to get to the moon. We don't know how we're going to get there, but the point is to try and we'll figure it out along the way. But they've also said, we want to be 50% circular by 2030. So 50% of the materials that are in use in our city in 2030 should be being reused and refurbished and repurposed again and again. And that's on the way. Now, that to me is an example through material use, through food waste, through construction, through consumer goods, moving to a circular economy. So there are districts in Amsterdam where all the construction is using material that has a material passport of where it's been or where it can go. So that if those buildings are disassembled, they know where to store those materials and where, how they can be used again. So that's an example of regenerative design. And then for example of distributive design, I'm going to come to a city in the UK in Preston, which is a place where the economy really had declined. And they thought they were going to have a big shopping mall built from big outside investment, come and build a big shopping mall. And then it was cancelled. Nobody was coming to save them. And it was at that moment they realised we're going to have to do this ourselves. Our, our local economy has been stripped out. Most of, the, most of the money that's spent here is going to multinational corporations who hide it in a tax haven and pay tax, who knows where. So they began to use the power of procurement in the local government institutions. They were buying food and clothing and uniforms and books and desks for schools and for hospitals and for the city administration offices themselves, for museums, for universities. And they started to use their purchasing power to buy locally, to buy from employee-owned companies, to buy from minority-owned companies, to buy from cooperatives. And that meant that the money being spent in their city was being reinvested in community and would therefore be retained. And this is known as community wealth building. And is one really nice example of distributive design so that everybody is benefiting from that economic opportunity. So I've shared the, the circular policy in Amsterdam and the community wealth building in Preston as examples of regenerative and distributive design. And I'm sure there's plenty of things, no matter how small or wide in Hawaii, but I would love to hear of what you would what you would point to if you were showing me some of these practices in your island. Sure. Yeah. Well, thank you for those um, important and, and stunning examples, because I, I think it's that is uh, part of the challenge in making this transition is, um, you know, it's very easy to say, well, how do we get there? <laughs> We've never been there before. <laughs> um, and, you know, having these examples, these tangible examples help us to, to learn and to navigate and to guide together. 
Um, you know, I think here in our islands, one, and, and there are, you know, numerous examples I think that I could give of, um, but one that really comes to mind solidifies some of the things that you're saying um, are, are around this initiative that was actually started by um, a mentor of mine, uh, Neil Hannes, who's called Aina Ulu. And, um, and you know, he, he had this insight where, you know, um, this particular Kamehameha Schools, which is a, a large landowner, it, it inherited the lands of a Hawaiian princess, um, and she left it for the education of future Hawaiian youth, um, you know, held these lands throughout Hawaii. And, you know, what he did was in, there was a period where it was, it was all about economic gain and opportunity. And so Kamehameha schools had developed their lands. They actually filled in some of these fish ponds that I had mentioned. And uh, when he arrived in the organization, he said, well, you know, there's got to be more going on here than um, we're going to lose our ancestral practices and traditions to make a buck. Um, and then he started to think about, you know, these multiple returns. And he said, look, we could use this site. It might not be the best place for, you know, making a bunch of money if we're going to lose our culture. But what if we restore a fish pond and we educate our kids? You know, what if we reassert our cultural traditions at the same time as we're learning science, uh, marine science in a fish pond and studying climate change? And, and so, you know, he, he and others, you know, helped to invest and, and champion, you know, uh, Hawaiian leadership around my generation. And, and so when you go around Hawaii today, I, I, I'm incredibly inspired by my peers, um, people that are out there on the aina that are doing some of this work. And, you know, when you, when you think about it, that those collective sets of returns are so much more than just economic. Um, they're providing, people are eating from the fish ponds and feeding themselves. But, um, what you can't gauge is, is that next generation that has learned, you know, from these places and, and understood these insights and what are the kinds of innovations that they're going to achieve. Um, yeah. And there's this incredible opportunity and resilience all across our islands. But I think if you're looking at it through that old economic model, um, you, you might not see its worth. You might not quite get it. <laughs> and this is where, you know, your, your insights around, you know, donut economics and, and, sharing these other um, insights and what's happening in other places is just incredibly informative and powerful. And this takes me right back to the beginning of our conversation where I mentioned Simon Kuznets, who in the 1930s was asked to come up with one number to measure the output of the US economy. And he did and, and, and named all the caveats of what it was missing. It, it, didn't, it didn't take account of the unpaid caring work of parents, it, the value created in community, and it counted the value of timber cut down, but not the loss of the value of the forest. I really believe that if Simon Kuznets was alive today and understood what we now understand about our profound dependence upon living systems of the earth, because Western society has been late in waiting up, waking up to this, and could see the data that's available today. We don't need to add everything up in dollar signs. We can measure Earth's breathing. We can see the carbon dioxide coming and going through the years and see her breath in and breath out. And of course, the measurements in Hawaii have been incredibly important towards that. We can see the concentrations increasing. We can measure the acidity of the oceans. We can measure the health of our ecosystems. I profoundly believe that Simon Kuznet said, wait, what? Why would you want to add it up into one number? Let's use a dashboard. And the donut is one kind of dashboard that you can precisely use to that. So if you were to bring the project of reopening up uh, the fish ponds, there are so many values that you just spoke to that are created here in terms of health and education and connection and, and understanding, as well as ecological values that are created when we restore those ecosystems, that they don't show up in that one number. So I think ours is the century of data. I think we are going to have the advantage that for, for decades, GDP has been the thing where economists have put so much time and effort into measuring it quarter on quarter on quarter, and it's reported in the news. But now we have data almost in real time about natural and social metrics, measuring and, and listening to planet Earth in her own metrics. Why would you flatten those into a number with a dollar sign in the front of it? We can understand so much more richly. I mean, if I show you this picture and tell you this is the state of humanity, it's so much richer than if I said we were trillions of dollars in debt that it, it's flat. 
It doesn't mean anything. This this tells us. So I really think there's an amazing new project of these multi-metrics and, and the richness of what you just described can be captured and understood, or at least experienced through those. Mm, fantastic. So we'll make it happen, Kate, one day when, <laughs> when things are right. You know, please come to our islands and, and visit um, and, you know, meet some of our incredible community leaders. Um, I, I think we're getting close to the to the end. So I wanted to get to a couple of questions. I think we've actually touched on some of them from um, our chat that have been sent to me. So uh, I think we touched on this one. Um, if, if you believe donut economics among the indigenous peoples of the world um, exists and if there's things to learn there, I think you've sort of spoke to that already. Um, and can I say actually that I... I... I, so I, I am profoundly steeped in Western culture, worldviews, for the, all the lack of, of, of richness that that gives me, but I'm absolutely aware that I come from there. And when I wrote Down Edge Economics, I was drawing on the literature that I was never taught at university, but I was drawing on feminist economics and ecological economics and commons thinking and complexity thinking. But even since I've written the book, I've become so much more aware, as I think many Westerners actually have become more aware of the richness and the echo that ideas like donut economics are a faint echo of a much older, richer uh, indigenous culture. And one book here on my shelf that's profoundly influenced me uh, in recent years, I don't know if you can see that, Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer. Uh, it's just a very beautiful book. And I've been very privileged to have conversations with people from different indigenous traditions and communities, from the Maori to the Sami people. And I'm really honored every time they say that donut concept, it echoes our culture. And I, I, I honestly think it's a faint Western echo. It's the Westerners, us, who need to find images, find language to creep back towards that much deeper regenerative sense that I think has been held in cultures like yours, uh, that you can reach back to a song from your grandmother and it's there. Uh, so I, I think there's a, and I, I feel it, I see it. There's a, there's a, amongst many people from Western cultures, a real humility starting to awaken of realizing where we need to learn from. Mm. Mahalo. Thank you for that, Kate. And I just want to thank and honor, you know, so many of the kupuna, you know, are in the midst of tremendous change and challenges, uh, you know, here in Hawaii, the, the people that have had the courage to, to advocate for our values and our worldviews and, and to not let them be <laughs> uh, obliterated. And, and, you know, we really have them to thank um, that, that we share this, this Ike today. Um, another, another question, Kate, from our audience um, discusses markets um, and the role of markets in economics. And she's, uh, they're asking, um, does the market have a role in sustainability? Um, if so, what is that role? How does one go from valuing extremely different values in, in the system? That's a profound question. That's a profound question. Um, I think markets do have a role in the sense of market-based exchange, because I, I believe, and I've seen it, we've all seen it across many cultures, um, a healthy engagement of people in market spaces. And I'm thinking about market stalls. I'm thinking about people selling their produce. I love going to car boot sales, which in the UK is where people sell their, their things they no longer need in their home. They drive into a field and they set out a table of all the things they want to sell. That's my favorite market. And if we're going to talk about free markets, to me, this is the place where people are selling things they want to sell. And everything that you buy comes with the story. Oh, you want that back? It used to belong to my mother and I've had it in my family for years. And I'm really happy that you, and it comes with story and connection. And actually it can be a wonderful experience. I, I think of people I know who own small restaurants that only seat 20 people and that's it. And they take great pride and pleasure in feeding and serving food to people. So I think markets can be a powerful tool. They've just gone way out of balance because economics says, well, country economics, this is the market. And we start on day one with the supply and demand of the market as if that was the economy. And let's remember that ekos nomos, the, the ancient Greek, comes from 
It means the art of household management. Now, how we manage our households depends on many things. Let me quickly show you the, the main diagram that I think should be taught first in economics, not supply and demand. And I, I lockdown gave me many things indeed to make everything in a cardboard cutout, to recognize that the, the economy is embedded in society. It's a social construct. We invented it. And the beauty, therefore, is we can reinvent it. It's about our relationships to each other and how we provision our wants and needs. And society and all of human systems, of course, are embedded within the living world. But here inside the economy, here's the market, yes, and that's where mainstream economics starts, and then it goes to the state, and as I was saying earlier, it forgets the household and the commons. Now, I'm going to pull that away because behind there are these many different roles we play and, and who we are in the economy depends on whether we think we're in a market space and we behave as consumers or producers and we bargain and we barter. But actually over here, we may be in, in relation to the state, a resident, public servant, a voter or protester, equally important economic roles. We are parent, partner, relative and child. We are steward, repairer, carer and co-creator. And to me, what we need to do is recreate a balance between these four forms of provisioning. The second half of the 20th century, certainly in the UK and the US, massively overstretched the role of the market and made a presumption that we should start with markets. They were the first best solution. If you want to solve something, bring in the market. And only if the market doesn't work, try and fix it with something else. And I don't think that's the way to go. I think markets have a place, but it's contained what, as I said, they don't. They only work for those who can pay the rest they ignore. They only value what's priced the rest they exploit. And so they have to be very carefully constructed. And to me, it's crucial also, we think about who owns enterprise because mm -hmm. ownership profoundly shapes what market actors want to do, whether they say, well, our goal here is to sell and make profit so we can expand endlessly. Well, we're, we're, now we're back to this one, mm -hmm. right? A market's being used to do this then I think they could be incredibly destructive. But if market, if the market relation is used to run an enterprise that enables me to be part of my community and have a flow of money between households, exchanging goods and services at a, at a scale that is human and that is owned and purposed in a way that keeps it true to those values, that I see that they can have a, a valuable role. I also know that many people are very mistrustful of whether that can be achieved. All I can say is I've not yet seen a society, I've not personally been into a country where I can imagine take away the market and it would work. So I think it's a really important question about how we rebalance these very different ways that we provision for our wants and needs, the market, state, the household, and the commons. How can we regulate and create societies where the market is in service to humanity and finance is in service to humanity rather than us in service to finance? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kate. Mahalo. And I, I would like to continue our collaboration and conversation, I hope, um, in the future. And, you know, I've heard you in other discussions talk about sort of the benefits of being early adapters, you know, in, in accepting boundaries and accepting regulation uh, that gets us to be more sustainable. And then, therefore, when other places in the world also want to adapt, we have some experience. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I think I think there's a lot <clears throat> that, that you're tying together there for us really to, to chew on and, and to consider. Um, so mahalo nui, Kate, for uh, the time. I, we're coming to a close. That was a, one of the fastest hours I've been a part of. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> uh, thank you for the rich conversation. Um, and, uh, you know, let me also mahalo the Hawaii Book and Music Festival um, for putting on the program. Um, I want to mahalo the Better Tomorrow Speaker Series uh, for their production um, and, you know, being a joint venture of University of Hawaii, Hawaii Community Foundation and Kamehameha Schools. Um, and Kate, wow, thank you so much. Uh, incredible wisdom and, and your work and insight and your energy, your diagrams, <laughs> um, you know, everything that you contributed um, in revolutionizing, you know, our, the way that we're thinking about economies and, and who they serve, for whom and, and why. <laughs> and um, I, hope, I hope we can continue to have this conversation. And, and um, I'm certainly going to be looking to your lab to learn uh, more of these intricacies and how it's happening across the world. Um, I, I want to thank um, everyone for joining us today. Um, I believe, you know, if we're going to build a, an economy here in Hawaii that allows 
and provides for all of us, not just a few of us, um, you know, to thrive and, and to protect our aina, our resources. Um, we, we have to change the way we think and act. And these conversations and understanding what in international best practices are, I think are a key way for us to inform, you know, the future of our islands, knowing not only that we have to change, but that it is achievable um, and that we can build off our ancestral values, perspectives, wisdom, and we can build on the resilience of each other. Thank you very much indeed. And anybody who's interested, please do pop over to Donut Economics Action Lab and check out the amazing work that changemakers are doing putting these ideas into practice. Mm -hmm.